I'm Lisa Hayshow. Welcome to the Legacy Interviews. Today I have Erin Cottrell. She's an actress and she's been in Hollywood for over a decade and she has been on numerous television shows so you probably recognize her. And she is also part of the New Hollywood which is a woman's goal group and it is a phenomenal group and I know several of the members and I'm trying to get them all on this show <laughs> because what they all share in common is they not only are successful but they're strong women leaders, they give back, philanthropists, and they're always looking to ask themselves, how can I serve? And that's a group of people I wanna be associated with, and that's what this show is about. So I am going to learn about Erin along with you. So hi, Erin. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. Good, good. It's so exciting to have you here. <laughs> I am very excited to be here. This is one of my favorite things is just to sit and have a conversation. So I want to know how, where you started from and how you got to L.A. and how you found your way in the film business, because I know it's always a challenge mm -hmm. to get your first roles, and how you managed to um, get married, be happily married, have a child, and all the lessons in between. Nice. The lessons yes. in between, that's like the real yeah, stuff, that's right? the meat. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I'm, I was born in New Jersey, uh, moved to Pennsylvania when I was about 10, and loved theater. My mom is a dance teacher and a choreographer, oh. so I grew up dancing in the studio with her and doing every musical I could possibly get my hands on. Um, and then... So you were doing musicals at a young age. Yeah, yeah. So when I was six, my mom pulled me into the first show she was in, which was not a musical, it was Dracula. It was like a little creepy to be in Dracula at six years old, but it was fun and it was my mom, so it wasn't that scary. And then at seven, I did a musical of Midsummer Night's Dream um, and then uh, a tour of The Nutcracker and loved it. And then by the time I was nine, I got to do Annie and that's like every little girl's dream. So that was like, oh, I love this. And it was just, you know, that was community theater, but it was so, so much fun and it was Absolutely. family. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. My mom choreographed it. You know, it was just... To me, the theater aspect of acting has always been what drew me in because the, it was my family, it was my closest friends, it was where I spent all my time, so that's so what I So you got into acting for the fun in the community more than fame, I want to be rich and famous. 100, 100, okay. 100 percent. And <laughs> I am, nice. yeah, I knock on wood because that I think has is what has led me into um, a life of semi-sanity inside of this business because you know, I think if your intention is to be famous or, you know, to make all the money or to be in the most movies, you get sidetracked by what your heart really wants to do with the acting, what your heart really wants to do in the creation process, because you're always worried about the bottom line or you're worried about what the next picture is or can you outdo yourself, um, not just create, I mean, creatively, I think you should always challenge yourself, but you can get so sidetracked by that. And so if I just always went back to, am I having fun? Do I like to do this? Then it's like, I'll do it for free, you yes. know? Yes, and you do. <laughs> and I have, yeah. I've done so many freebies with writing or acting myself because yeah. it's something you love to do. Exactly. Yes. Or if it's for charity, it's like I will mm -hmm. never balk at an opportunity to do that because it's, well, I got to do it anyway. That's fun. And then if it helps somebody, then, you know, even better. So, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So I started... Um, in the East Coast, and then I went to school in uh, University of North Carolina. And I started at UNC Asheville, went to UNC Chapel Hill is where I graduated from. I was super, uh, loved it there. Um, was a drama major. And that's like a self-starter program. If you're in it, you have to be motivated because you can do a zillion shows a year mm -hmm. if you want. Um, it's not a conservatory, it's where they you know mandate things. But if you're motivated, you can do a ton of stuff. You can write, produce, direct, act. Um, and, you know, there's some smarty pants people there. So I felt really, really grateful to be in that environment mm. of intense academia alongside of um, the love for theater. Because I didn't want to just be an actress and, yes. you know, sit myself in a conservatory bubble, which is awesome. Some of my best friends have done that and they're brilliant and well adjusted. Um, but, but what, it, how do you feel about you have to be crazy and screwed up to make it in Hollywood? Because you look like apple pie. <laughs> <laughs> You're still sane. And I'm, I'm like, trying. I'm trying to, you know, yeah. some days my husband would, you know, attest to that or not <clears throat> agree with that. But he, um, I, I think that a lot of it has to do with not identifying with 
being one thing and spe not identifying specifically with being an actor. Um, I think it's great. It's something that I do. It's something that I love to do. But who I am and how um, I find my self-worth isn't connected to that. And I think that's the biggest downfall that a lot of women in particular have or get into in the industry is when they're not working or they age out of a certain type, it becomes, you know, their value and their self-worth just gets completely mm -hmm. lost. Um, and they don't know really why they're doing what they're doing. I actually gave a talk at the New Hollywood. We do these great things at our meetings called, you know, what do you know? And we each get 15 minutes to talk about the things that we feel like we could give the most of. And this is a group of a lot of actresses, and not just actresses, motivational speakers and musicians and um, writers, but I said, I'm, I'm really happy with where I've come um, through the ups and downs, which I'm, I will share with you as well. Um, really happy with that medium, like where I just kind of find a balance. And a lot of that comes from knowing why I pursue acting. And I think a lot of actresses, if you get down to the why, you will either go, oh my gosh, I'm doing this for the wrong reason. I'm doing it to prove to a bunch of people back home that I'm good enough. Or I'm doing it to, um, you know, show my mom that I can achieve this thing even though she didn't believe in me or I'm doing it because I don't feel good enough about myself so I need the world to tell me that I'm good enough and I think a lot of people in the entertainment industry whether they're aware of it or not like that ends up being at the core and you know I had to come to that too what why the heck am I doing it and um, one of the best things or that who I'm, would you be without yes I'm an actress yes so. yeah um, one of the best things that happened my mom when I was in college said to me as I was like a senior in, in college as a drama major said you're not doing this for me right because she mm. always she was in community theater and a choreography but she never really got to pursue it and I just stop and really think about that and say like to him, who am I doing this for and I'm really glad she asked me that because once I went no what is it that I love okay it's being on stage and being so out of my own body <laughs> you know, like inhabiting another character, that I lose time, you know, you, it's the thing, when you do what you love, you kind of lose your awareness of everything else and you just get sucked up in the momentum of it. And when I realized, oh no, it's that transcendence of like channeling something else kind of, or um, the creative process of, of making a character, that's the stuff that I really loved. And when I got clear that that was the motivation, then the other stuff didn't hurt as much because there's a ton of doors being shut in your face all the time you know there's a lot of no um how do you handle the no's i think especially after a high like yeah getting a part and then all of a sudden you don't get a part i remember when i started i just got on a train met a extra agent mm -hmm. on the train mm -hmm. and she put me in some a commercial as an extra and then i got they plucked me from the extras and gave me a non-speaking part but a very important part mm -hmm. and it was like $26,000 nice. compared to $80 for the day. Yes. And then from there I got two movies in a row, boom, boom. Then I'm like, I am this is the coolest thing. Everyone said it's so hard to make it in Hollywood within a week. I have my SAG card. I've got these movies. Yeah. And then nothing. Yes. Nothing. Yes. Then I'm like, what happened? I'm still me. Yes. But I think it gets to your head and I was 22 and it's just whatever happened and it's, yeah. And I quit at 24 going, I don't want this roller coaster. And I have friends that that's happened to as well, where they stumbled into it. It wasn't something they loved mm -hmm. first. Um, a good friend of mine was um, uh, in, what is that movie with Mila Jovovich, The Fifth Element. Yes. At 19, she was discovered in London and thrown in this thing. But it was the same thing. It was that mentality of, oh, this just happens. And it'll continue yeah, to happen. Yeah. And it's fun. And it's I'm so easy. It. Yes. And it, I think what when you know the success comes as rapidly as it did to you, you also realize how random the success can be. Yes. You know, that it's not grounded in, uh, in a lot. Now, a lot of times it is. You need to be the best actress in the room yes. to prove it. Uh, I mean, yes. so often. 
But also at a certain level you realize, no, these offers are going out to um, the actor that has the biggest name, that mm -hmm. can have the biggest box office draw. You know, it's a, it's a numbers game at a certain level. Um, I have another dear friend who's an actress who books every commercial she's ever gone out for and tons of guest stars, but now she's known and she's in a room with a bunch of other women that have a lot of experience too. And, and you know, when you have that moment of, why am I not booking all the time? It's like, you're in a bigger game now. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> I even did a short film that was just a short. And I had several actors, and I liked two or three of them, mm -hmm. unknowns. Mm -hmm. Then a friend of mine said, oh, you can't use an unknown. You need a celebrity. So they brought in a few celebrities, and I used them. Mm -hmm. And they were not as good, the one that I chose, as the yeah. unknowns. But I thought, I need a name yeah. to get it out. Yeah. Absolutely true. Afterwards, I said, why did I make that decision? I was you know, pushed in that direction out of insecurity and, oh, I guess I need, they know more than I do, mm -hmm. instead of using my gut. Mm -hmm. going, I feel so bad for that person who now is going, what What did I do wrong? Yeah, yeah. And that's what it is. So you have to have, you know, just strength of character and knowing who you are and not yeah. letting this get to you. And nudity, nudity, nudity. When I was working in the mm. business, it's all about nudity. Oh, and geez. That's when I said, oh, I don't want this because I... You know you're an ingenue yeah. so can you talk a little bit about that journey with women because a sure. lot of people even who I coach talk about how they feel you know used and it's always it's for the part and then they don't want to do it and a lot of them do then they end up going oh I regret it and so well how do you yeah I think that's getting clear too with how is it gonna make you feel mm -hmm. you know are you gonna do this role and feel really good about it no matter what the lighting looks like if you're yes, if you know yes. if you're nude if you're doing it you gotta fully commit and choose that yeah and if you're comfortable with it yeah it's your choice and and if you're not at all don't do it i promise i i've been working for tw tw 13 years um mostly in television and i have never i have never been pressured into anything like that and i think a lot of that also comes with that you come into the room, you kind of teach people how so to treat true. you. So true, so true. You know, yes. and it's even- It's in, written on your forehead. Exactly, yes. and Take they know. Of me or, yeah. Yes, even photographers, I've, I remember doing, you know, photo shoots and they're like, we're gonna do this and this, and I'm like, no, I, I don't know who you think you're talking to, but that's not, I don't need those photos. You might want to take those photos, but that's not something I need, you know, and, and I really do believe that, um, it's certainly not your fault, but I feel like to give you some sense of control, you know that you walk in there and you make your choices ahead of time. And if it's not, you don't need the role badly enough because there's gonna be something else that comes that's more appropriate for you. And that role could hurt you. It sure. Could make you walk the, you know, hall of shame for a while where you then you're, or make you bitter, make you angry, and that could prevent you from getting the role too. Yeah, and that it's, you want. exactly. It, it's really all how you perceive it because there are a zillion brilliant actresses that have gone topless and this, that, or the other, and it's really how, what your attitude mm -hmm. is about it. You know, I- Like you said, you have to own it and say, yeah. I'm comfortable with this because I want to help serve and this is the way this character was and it's part of sure. who she is, not just gratuitous yeah. nudity for the sake of the producers wanting to sell money, you know, sell the picture. <laughs> sure. Well yeah. I think of Halle Berry and Monsters Ball. Oh, yes. Right. Brilliant. And was naked but totally served the story. Um, and I also saw an interview recently with Vanessa Williams mm -hmm. and she was offered that part first or was one of the people it was offered to first and she just had a baby and she was like, Nope. <laughs> I'm not going to get no. naked with my body looking the way it does now, um, which I thought was really fascinating yes. too. So sometimes it's not about, ooh, do I feel cheap or whatever. It's like, ooh, do I want the world to see me yes. in this state <laughs> yes. of how I am, which is something actually that now, after having a child six months ago, um, has been an interesting thing because I had a baby and then had to go right into a premiere and do a red carpet and all this stuff. And it was like, what do I do? Do I bust my butt and potentially harm myself as I'm breastfeeding to try to look a certain way on the red carpet or do I just feed my child, eat well, you know, and try to get some sleep and do it. And I, and I chose the latter. It was, mm. I, <laughs> I mean, it was not without like, oh, I'll find a dress that's, you know, helpful. But at the same time, I didn't want to be that woman that was like, I had a kid 
and now I got to step into the spotlight and look like I never gained a pound because that's not real. No. And I think you do a disservice to a bunch of brilliant moms who are working and, you know, trying to stay healthy and feed their kids and do what they can. And you're telling them, you got to look this way immediately after having a kid. And that's just not the truth. You know, a lot of it is Photoshop and, you know, hidden. Yes. And yes. So I don't want people to feel badly about the way, especially women that have just gone through such a tremendous ordeal and gift as, you know, childbirth that they have to be super skinny right away or ever again. You yes. know, it's just be, be yeah, whatever's right for you at that moment and yeah. for your body. Who yeah. cares? Like I just moved to Spain for a few months and I'm going mm -hmm. back and I put on some weight and I'm like, I don't regret it. I want to eat the churros dipped in chocolate if that's what they do. I yes. want to have my cafe con leche. Yes. And I know I could get it back. I just yes. want to live. Yes. In Europe, I want to eat European food. I'll have bread, which I normally don't eat. And yeah. just because you can't always worry, be worried about what are other people going to think. I'm not going to eat this. Then people, you know, I'm this or I'm that and I'm going to be judged. Yeah, so. I, don't have, I don't have time for that either. I'm, yeah. yeah, I've got one more year until I'm 40. Uh -huh. So I feel like, A, be honest about my age, but B, like there's just no time to not enjoy the stuff that's Isn't in that front of you. Isn't that great about aging? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice would you give to your um, high school self? Uh, to... With everything you've been through. Uh, I would say... Your heart's going to get broken, but it's going to heal. Um, I would say you're enough. You know, that's a big one, I think, it's when you're huge. young. How do you teach people you're enough? Mm. Like, you have a daughter, six-month-old. What yeah. are you going to teach this daughter that you're enough? I think Any a parenting tip. Yeah, that, well, I mean, it's a, it's a brand new one. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I was a teacher for a long time, so that... Um, I could speak a little bit to that and how I saw it affect girls, young girls. Um, but it's about self-acceptance. I'm a big fan of, of accepting the moment for what it is, even if it's awkward and terrible and mm -hmm. painful um, or you're stuck in traffic. You know, I'm, tr I'm trying. It's an active pra uh, practice for me to know that whatever is happening right now is exactly what's supposed to be happening right now and then move forward with it. So I think teaching her to accept herself, how she is, to follow the things that she's impassioned by. You know, whatever sparks her interest, to follow that. And I think if you do that, then you self-love starts to come because you feel like not only are you good at something, but you're inspired by things. And then the more inspired you are, you radiate that out and other people feel it and you have better relationships, yes. right? So I think that's the panacea. It's like this, this brilliant little magical potion is do the thing you love or whatever it is. It could be 18 things, you know, painting in the morning and, you know, violin at night or whatever. But um, when you do that, it starts to change without sounding too magical and weird. It changes your vibration of, you know, your happiness does and it radiates out. And I find that when I'm happiest and doing the things I love, that life really falls into place a lot easier. That the people that are kind of in the same vibration of the same mind come to you, the opportunities that are of the same ilk come to you. And also accepting the fact it's not going to be at that level yes. all the time. Yes. That's been a big journey for me. Having just done the movie that I just did, we shot it two years ago and it was one of the best times of my whole life. Um, shooting it with these, like, I did this movie with uh, Ray Liotta and Ashley Judd and um, Seth Green and I didn't know that they were all in it until I got down there. Um, I thought I was just doing this little independent film. It's really crazy, actually. This is a, a story for, I think, people will <laughs> want to hear about sticking to it. I firmly believe that if a part is yours, it's yours, and you can't really do anything to, to screw that up. This movie, The Identical, that I did was written, and the producers, the family of producers, watched a series that I did on the Hallmark Channel, right? I think it's mostly, you know, people in the Midwest that love this movie and young girls and I was very happy to do it, but not super popular in Los yeah. Angeles. And um, these producers really loved it and said, okay, for this movie, we would like Erin to play this part, which was like the female lead, the wife of the main character. And they went to the casting director and said, we would like for Erin to do this. And she said, oh, I don't know, I don't know who that is. And she's not famous enough to play this part, right? It's similar to your situation. 
um, I'll find you the right person. I'll find you a more famous woman. So for a year and a half of casting, <laughs> they went through Hollywood. It was going to be Amanda Seyfried. It was going to be Brooklyn Decker. It was going to be Mandy Moore. It was Everyone who kind of looks like you. Kind of, yeah. Of you. yeah. <laughs> Version of the type. Same energy, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it was going to be all of these people, and none of it worked. They would film auditions, or they would have a conflict, or whatever. It was just not working, not working, not working. And then they also auditioned about another 100 women. Um, and it was about two weeks before principal photography. I had no idea this was happening, by the way. This is all happening. Did you go in already or no? No. You never had, even went in? Never okay. even heard of okay. it. Two weeks before they cast, or they were about to film, um, the producer said, okay, will you now see this woman that we asked for in the very beginning? And again, the cast director said, I don't know, I don't know. Fine, I'll see her, but I'll also see like five other women that day. And I went in and I read for it and she didn't the casting director didn't even read me she had her assistant do it but she watched the tape as it was happening and by the time i went down into the lobby she came out and shook my hand and just said oh, i just wanted to introduce myself and hi nice to meet you and i just didn't really think anything of it and then the next day they called and cast me in the film and to me because they, they saw the tape and went oh yeah she was like yeah you're right this is who should have been playing it from the beginning um i didn't know any of this until i got Nashville to shoot it and then they also said and your mother-in-law is Ashley Judd your father-in-law is Ray Liotta your best friend Seth Green you're doing <laughs> I thought wait what I just I was happy I was getting paid well to do a movie you yes. know and and um and so grateful so grateful that they stuck it out too that they had faith and and said look our family loves watching you as you know this woman on the prairie um and uh, it was one of the best experiences of my life. And so, A, it gave me faith that if it's yours, it's yours, no matter what the forces are that are trying to fight against you. But B, if it's not yours, it's not yours. And that's something to just let go and accept, you know, to just try to, again, accept the moment for exactly what it is. This part isn't yours, it's not yours. And try to move forward and see the next thing. You know, it's not, it's not immediate. Yes. You have to, I have to process it if it's something that I have my heart set on. Um, but you, what you're probably trying to say is don't lose your sense of self. Oh, totally. And don't take it personally because it's all about the fame thing. Those people were fine. It was just, you're not famous enough, which I did not articulate to them. It was just, sorry, we already cast it. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. You don't, you can't go into detail with everybody, but. Of course. Yeah, so you, it. You might be going home saying, what did I do wrong? Let me change this up. Let me color my hair. Let me lose mm -hmm. another 10 pounds mm -hmm. to make the next job easier to get. But it's not. Whoever you are is perfect. Yes. And you yeah. miss the next job because you're trying to be somebody else. Yes. Yes. You That's know? a great point. <laughs> you, 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 yeah. Anytime you try hard. I know for me, anytime I tried hard for something, I never got it. Anytime I let go and just... Live yeah. like when I came here, I was just like, oh, whatever, Hollywood, sure, I'll take it. I went to audition. I'm not an actress, so sure, what do you want me to do? And it's like, yeah. she's great. Once, oh, I've got to be an actress now. This is bigger. Let me act. Right. And it was like, bye. Yeah. Like, what am I doing wrong? Now I get it, but back then. Yeah. And people it, fed off that energy yes. of you in the beginning, not needing it. And not... I don't care. And I didn't expect to get it. It was just like, oh, what are auditions like? Let me yeah. just see. And yeah. it's like, oh, hi. You know? And you're having I'm, fun, I'm right? Having fun. And that's what people want to be around other people having yes. a good time. That's yes. what I was saying earlier. It's like if you're loving what you do, then it doesn't matter. So I think Brian Cranston said it best. It's like if you go in, you do the character how you're going to do it the best way that you can and make it your own. Yes. And be if, the best version of you you can be. Exactly. And if that's not right, that's okay. I had a really cool opportunity to see that in action um, when they cast Medium, the pilot, yes. the uh, Patricia Arquette. So instead of Patricia doing all the screen tests with the actors that they were going to cast as the series regulars, um, I had just been cast in a series that was going to shoot in a few months, so I had some time off. And they said, well, let's bring Erin in and just she'll be the pretend Patricia Arquette for these screen tests. And they paid me to sit with all of the different actors, you know, three for each choice, the husband, the mm, DA or whatever yeah. it was. So I got to see, okay, who are the final choices? And we, I did full scenes with them, um, with Glenn Gordon Karen, the actual producer. We filmed them like real scenes. And no actor was necessarily better than the other. They were just themselves. They were different. And the actor... God love him, I don't remember his name. The guy who played the, the husband was actually the least prepared. He was still had his sides in his hand and was doing it, but he was so charming. And there was something so relaxed about him 
that he booked it. That was it. He got it. Where the other guys were, they had it cold and they knew all their stuff. And so it was really fascinating. And sometimes, too, it's about racial diversity. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, we cast a white guy here. We need a Latino guy here. We have a this here. We need a this here. Brunette, blonde, you know. So it's... Sometimes you win, that's mm -hmm. in your favor, and yes, sometimes, sometimes it's not it's in not. your favor. Yes. Yeah, I'm psyched when they need a redhead, yes. but you know, sometimes they don't, and that's okay too. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, yeah, that's wonderful. What else are you doing in your life to balance career? Because you have a family now. Mm -hmm. How does that tie in or affect your career? Because a lot of women say, you can't have it all. I have a baby, I don't mm -hmm. have time to do that. Or or I have a career, I don't have a time to have a baby yet, and they postpone it, then they feel they missed out. So what is the moment where you said, it's time to have a child, mm. um, and I can balance both, and what is the secret to balancing both? I think you shared a little with me off camera mm. about you don't go to every party anymore. Oh gosh, yeah, well, yeah. You, sometimes you can't. Yes. You know, you just physically, I can't. I'm either exhausted or I'm just, my daughter needs me. And my husband is working full time too, so I'm home is a lot. Is he also an actor? Uh, sometimes he's an actor. He's also um, uh, an electrician for film and TV. So he okay. does lighting, so he has the same crazy hours. Um, so if he's working, then I need to be home with her for the most part now. She's still pretty of little. Of course. Um, but we did fly her to New York and do a red carpet premiere. <laughs> and, you know, she was four months old. We had to do it and flew back in 48 hours. But that's an ongoing lesson for me. I'm trying to learn that as I go right now. That's how does it all work? Um, I've only gone on a handful of auditions. And I, they've all come very close recently and then not. I was almost in... I don't know if this is gonna break anything. I don't think it will. I was almost in Paranormal Activity Five. Mm -hmm. It came down to like the final things of that, and like there are just a bunch of opportunities again where I say, "All right, if it's gonna happen, cool. I'll make it work with my daughter. We'll figure it out. I'll either you can hire a nanny on location. You know, a friend can come with you and be there to take care. Especially in Los Angeles, I know they mm -hmm. have a lot of there are nurseries on sets, or you know, you can have a nanny with you." Um, but I think emotionally it's challenging. Now that she's six months old, I think I would be okay to mm. go back on set. You have a lot of downtime too, to be honest. You know, you could be working for a couple of days and then have a few days off for a, a film or a guest Absolutely. star. Absolutely, even on a film, sometimes after hair and makeup, you sit there for three hours. Yeah. You could easily sit there with your child and play a little and come back and yeah. still 20 minutes before it's your time to get into character. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and when you ask like what made you think this was the time. It was honestly like, I'm getting old and my husband and I have been together for a while, so I just, let's just see what happens. There was That was another part of it, mm -hmm. was letting go of when that would happen, of just saying, okay, well, hopefully we'll get pregnant. And, you know, again, knock on stuff that we did. Um, but that was also part of the big acceptance thing as well, was just saying, okay, this is gonna happen when it happens. And then, of course, I had a baby and then immediately had to do a red carpet. So, oh, you know, yes, you're like, exactly. uh, the timing wasn't great. But at least it was a few months after. It wasn't right when I was giving birth, so I didn't miss it or mm -hmm. anything. But um, but it also yeah. helps you prioritize. Oh, my you priorities are say, so different. Learn how to say no. Yeah. Learn when yes is really an important thing, like the red carpet. And you could say no to all the fun stuff that you normally would do, but yeah. not baby's more important. Yeah, so. it's a totally different mm -hmm. priority now. And if it's too taxing on my body, um, or if it was like, oh, you're gonna be in New Orleans for a week. If it's a few weeks, I can go do it and get somebody, but if it's just leaving, I can't, you know. Breastfeeding is a whole other thing. You're like tethered to your child yes. too, you yes. know. Um, but there's also, I wanted to speak to, um, when you said like, what else am I balancing with? For like a, over a decade, I um, worked with and still do work with a nonprofit organization called City Hearts. Mm -hmm. um, and and why do you do that? And how did that happen? I initially did it when I moved here um, for a job. To be honest, like I okay. was a dance teacher for them. My um, best friend was teaching for them, and they needed another dance teacher. And I had done that for a while growing up. Um, but it's essentially uh, the group goes into East LA, uh, parts of Ventura County, like up in Oxnard, really, you know, neighborhoods that are struggling from like serious gang violence and, you know, the kind of the most impoverished situations. And we go in 
and we give completely free arts classes to kids. I would go into um, an elementary school in Boyle Heights for a solid decade. I did that. When I wasn't filming, I was there twice a week. And I initially did it as a job um, the first year because I was like, oh, a little extra money and I can, you know, teach dance. And then I, you know, booked some big stuff and it wasn't about the money, but it was about missing those children. And every time I went, they could care less if I was on TV or, you know, whatever yeah. I did. It was we have Miss Erin to talk to about, you know, what was going on in their lives. And it was so far removed from um, how I grew up, although I grew up pretty poor. Um, their situation with, you know, feeling the pull to join into situations that were really pretty horrible. And, mm -hmm. um, and also for the young girls, their, the modeling that they had was their mothers and sisters, you know, when you're, you get pregnant at 14 or 15 and then you kind of start your family there, which there's no judgment on that, but they never ever saw another avenue. So part of what we did as City Hearts teachers was to show them, you can go to college, you can graduate high school, you can, you know, do all of these things and to be an example of that. So going there was a huge part of keeping my feet on the ground and not letting me think that I was, you know, bigger than, more than, whatever the heck, mm -hmm. because they could care less too. They just want me to show up. If I miss something because I'm shooting, they're like, oh, Miss Aaron, like, you know, they get upset mm -hmm. like that. Um, so it felt good to be wanted. And it also felt good to, you know, dance and jump around and um, do musical theater stuff with them and, you know, do little productions of Annie. It was all that stuff I loved as a kid that I don't really get to do as much anymore. I do some Yeah, I'd love to know, a lot of people watching this would feel, why do so many actresses or famous people give back or are attached to a charity? Is it just to make them look good or is it because they get something out of it? And I wanna know, what do you get out of it? What mm. do all these celebrities, including myself, of wanting to be involved in this charity or that charity mm -hmm. and the new Hollywood even, because mm -hmm. they're a goals group and somewhat they like love to give to charity. Yep because I want to inspire other people to give back because there's so much more in it and especially if you're famous or famous and beautiful you get criticized for it mm. I hear so many haters I read a lot of blogs and oh this person is doing this for this and that and you know just always negative towards that mm. so can you share because you know a lot of people a lot of celebrities and um, just even with the new Hollywood that give back for a reason and what yeah. you guys get from it. Yeah. Well, the new Hollywood is is specific. Like we got together just as a bunch of women that had um, acted with each other or, you know, we were friends like Brianna and I did a movie together, one of the Hallmark movies. Some of the other women we auditioned against each other. Mm -hmm. So that was we came together to be more of a community instead of to be we didn't want the cattiness to be pervasive. We wanted it to be about camaraderie and support. You know, and it was Brianna's brainchild too, because I think she just had a terrible experience with not being supported when she was younger, that she kind of went, okay, you and I get along, you and I get along, and just kind of brought us all in. And then we brought our friends in, and you know, there I think there are like 26 of us now. Um, but that, the charity aspect of that came from, uh, initially we would give each other gifts. And then the second year we went, this is silly, we don't need things. Why don't we, the money we would spend on that, why don't we vote on a charity? And mm. now we vote on, I think it's three different charities a year. And, you know, with every member donates $50 a time to each charity. So we, and then we do um, big benefits, Toys for Tots every Christmas. We do a huge gala for that. Um, we've done benefits for Free the Slaves. It's just a tremendous organization. City Hearts, who I taught for, has been donated to a couple of times one for um, just their general outreach, but then one of the girls that was a student of mine in like fifth grade, this is how old I am, uh, you know, got accepted to college. Mm. And not only did she get upset, you know, she was the first time she, first person in her family to graduate from high school, first person to go to college. And when it came down to it, she got all this funding and she was $3,000 short. And she was gonna have to not go. She was like, she was just gonna miss it. And so we rallied the troops and everyone from the New Hollywood donated and we sent her to college, you know. So what do we get out of it? Like, that's a pretty big thing to get out of it, to say that this girl, you know, was able to go on with her education because we all went, we can do without some, some cash right now. Mm -hmm. 
you know, for me personally, it's, it was a selfish endeavor to work with them because I love theater. I love sharing the music and the dance and everything with those kids. To me, that was like, oh God, we get to do this again. I get to be 10 again and sing these songs and show them stuff for the first time and have their faces light up and say like, I never, you know, I never would have, you know, been able to dance or do this. And a lot of it is also about the parents being able to see their kids in those situations, to see them up on stage in costume, to see, you know, there's a pride. They connect with their kids a little bit better. It's and you're giving all these kids a moment in their life they'll, that they'll always remember. I hope so. The first yeah. time they're on stage or the first time they were they danced and yeah. a teacher that they connected to that helped them, you know, get to the next level or, you know, really inspire them to choose dance as a career or the arts. Yeah, I hope so. You know, mm -hmm. that's the goal. Or um, to, this isn't for me, you know. Or this isn't it for is. me, yeah. yeah or I had a good time. Thing. Yeah, and, yeah. While doing it. Or, and, and to show up, you know, because the kids, when they commit to the classes, we make them, you know, like you're going to come to class and you're not just going to quit just because it's a little hard. Or, um, But some tremendous things have come of it. Um, we had, you know, I had one boy. A lot of times we, we have boys in class too. They're boys that aren't great in sports or mm -hmm. they're not, you know. And... So they're in our dance classes, or our, we teach Shakespeare and photography. Um, they, it's pretty full, pretty well rounded with all the classes. And we had one boy who just would draw these brilliant sketches of gowns, of dresses. He was like in fourth grade, fourth and fifth grade. I had him. Beautiful, beautiful sketches. And um, the owner of City Hearts just said, "This is crazy. We need to put you in touch with an actual designer." So. We went to um, the, what is it, Monique Lier? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in Hollywood, we brought this boy and his parents, and he got, you know, to meet the designer, and they were incredible. They looked through all of his sketches and then gave him sketchbooks, and I think, I think what ended up happening is they took one of his sketches and ended up making a mock-up of one of his dresses so he could see it, and he became, you know, he would design all of our costumes and things for the, the shows, but... We asked the father, you know, how do you feel about your son, you know, doing all this? And he said, honestly, I would so much rather him be sitting and sketching gowns, watching Princess Diaries and doing this in front of a TV than outside running with the other boys that are, you know, joining the gangs. It was, it was such a, he's like, thank God my son has mm. found something yes. because the, the other path, you know, to, to create a sense of community around the arts and have the kids feel proud about that as opposed to a sense of community inside of a gang. That's our main goal, really, you know, give you the, the tools to um, express yourself and, and be, have great camaraderie with other kids and be brave. It's hard to get up on stage. It is. You know? Very hard the first few times. Yeah. Especially, yes. Especially in front of other kids your age yes. and your school yes. and your parents and... So they feel really accomplished and, you know, so I love, I love them. And I stopped teaching actually when I went to shoot The Identical. And now I actually go in and um, sp like speak on behalf of City Heart. So I'll MC their shows. I just did an auction for them for their big fundraiser a couple weeks ago um, with Max Adler from mm -hmm. Glee. Mm -hmm. it was the um, so he helped with our anti-bullying campaign because he was like yes. the consummate bully on Glee. So he came in as we worked um, with like self-esteem issues and anti-bullying with the kids. So he and I kind of tag team hosted an auction, got to do a full nice. on like, do I hear 300, 300, 400, 400, it was fun. And we, you know, had some beautiful um, Beatles original photographs mm. that we got to auction off. So very long winded answer to your question. <laughs> yes, but, so with all of this behind you and this amazing career and family and experiences, what do you want your legacy to be? Mm. I want it to be self-love and acceptance um, and courage. I want people to have the courage to be able to follow their passion regardless of the obstacles that are inside of it because if it's meant to be yours, it's meant to be yours. You just got to keep going. Keep following the thing that you love and it'll all start to fall into place around you. Mm. I love that. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much for <laughs> being on you. the show this today. Is so great. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued after the camera's turned off. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Awesome. Thank you.